Hi, everybody. This is uh, Pete McGilvery. I'm with the Office of Environmental Management up here in Tallahassee um, with FDOT. Um, I'm joined today by Mike Konikoff, um, uh, one of our lead developers here um, that work on the statewide environmental project tracker. And today we're going to provide some training um, for folks that potentially want to participate um, from our local agency program um, with district permission. And the reason I say that is, um, as you'll hear as we go through this particular training, we're going to go through an over, overview of what the SWEP site um, does. Uh, we'll give you an overview of what it looks like. We'll talk about some logistics and stuff. Um, and as we go through it, we'll also talk through what the environmental document review process is, and we'll talk about how you gain access. Um, this access isn't necessarily open to everybody. It's access that's granted specifically by uh, the specific district environmental management office uh, leadership. Um, so if there are folks out there that have an interest in participating, you can work through your local um, lab coordinator who can also coordinate with your district environmental management office leadership to identify um, whether or not you're an individual who should have access to the secure system um, that we're going to demo today. Um, like I said, we're going to go through some logistics. We're going to give you an overview. Um, we want you to understand um, how things fit in the overall environmental document review process uh, and where, if you are a LAP agency participating in the process, sort of where you fit in that overall scheme. Uh, we'll also go through a couple of different demonstrations. The first one will be an overview of the SWEPT application itself. So that'll be some, some general navigation, where things are located, how you search and find things, how you look at a project page, things like that. Um, we'll give you some more details. And then um, Mike will come back on and, and give a, a demonstration of the um, some of the interactive forms uh, that are on the site. Um, specifically for this type of user community, the one we'll focus on is the type one um, categorical exclusion checklist and building up the project file uh, to support development of that checklist. So what I'm going to do is go through uh, the agenda a little bit. It's a little bit of a PowerPoint lead in and then we'll switch between myself uh, and Mike um, as we go through this training. Um, the folks that are connected, this is a webinar, so you guys are on mute. Uh, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to type those questions in the chat box. We have folks monitoring the chat box, and at appropriate times, we'll stop and answer those questions. Sometimes we'll jump right to it. If it's um, a question where maybe we answer it a few slides later, we might hold off. Um, but we'll uh, look at what the questions are, and we'll, we'll tackle them individually. The other thing I think is very important, and we continue to do, is uh, we're recording this webinar. We recognize everyone out there is absolutely busy. and this webinar may not have uh, fit into your schedule. So we want to make sure that we record uh, the session and then provide access to it. Um, this also can become an important resource because there may be a period of time between when you attended this webinar and if you gain access to this web application. Uh, you know, it might be several weeks or several months and it may be like, what did they say? How do I do this? Um, you'll have a, a resource that's being recorded that you could go back to and kind of re-see um, what we were looking at and re-hear what we were saying to you in this uh, training class. So with that, let's talk about SWEPT itself um, and what it was designed to do and why we do it. Um, the SWEPT application, the statewide environmental project uh, tracker application was developed when Florida Department of Transportation um, went after uh, NEPA assignment responsibilities from FHWA on highway projects. That was a, a fairly involved uh, process where we had to um, apply uh, to the federal government to take on those responsibilities. We had to modify our own um, local laws and work with our legislature to waive the sovereign immunity law as it relates to uh, actions taken uh, and approved under NEPA assignment. And what that means is that as a state, we could uh, potentially end up in court and have to defend ourselves in a federal court. Uh, previously, that was done by FHWA. To take on all of those additional responsibilities, 
Um, that also meant uh, in the negotiation of the MOU between ourselves and Federal Highway that there were lots of responsibilities that transferred, but also a lot of things that we had to um, report back and provide assurances for uh, and be able to uh, position ourselves uh, so that we're ready for uh, things that we have to do and, and demonstrate our performance and, and compliance. For instance, we annually would have to perform a self-assessment on all of the approvals that are going through the system. Annually, FHWA would come and audit us to review our project files and look at our processes and, and verify that we're all meeting the intent of the executed MOU. So the statewide environmental project tracker was this one system um, that allowed us to, to take all the great things that everybody's doing out there. All the districts had fantastic systems. All the districts had been developing environmental documents. All the districts had had ways of storing those those records and managing those records. And we needed to have a, a single, basically, portal or one-stop shop where all of those things could live. So that was the genesis for the statewide environmental project tracker is having this one-stop shop where we could track those projects around the state. Um, we handle electronic reviews and approvals. Uh, we established the project record and all of the supporting files um, for each project that's being approved in the state under NEPA assignment. Um, it's a location where we can do project file reviews for self-assessments or FHWA can do project file reviews for uh, their annual audit. Um, it allows us to um, look at timeliness and report back our quality and performance results, um, which, is, which are also required back to Federal Highway Administration. Um, part of NEPA assignment is, can we do it faster as a state than they did it as a federal government? So to do that, we've got to be able to track how long it's taking to complete various milestones and report on that. Um, the other thing it allows us to do is ha have this one-stop shop or where the records are being held. That also allows us to manage the files in a consistent way, establish a, a consistent naming convention. Um, each record type has a different uh, duration for which we should keep and retain those files. So this allows us to actively manage those files specifically, um, as well as should there happen to be a legal challenge, we have the capability to go and work through our uh, legal attorneys as well as our district staff and develop a, an administrative record from this online database. So at a very high level, that's sort of the key features of SWEPT and why we do it. Um, the, the folks out there that are part of the, the, the process, um, of course, it's been built to facilitate the review and approval of environmental documents. So the district environmental managers and the project development managers are on there. They serve as a, a local approval authorities. You've got the district um, project managers as well as the various team members, their specialists. Um, if there are uh, lab participants that have been identified in the local district that those individuals should have access to the system, they are part of the community as well. Um, we've got uh, OEM QA, QC staff here. We've got our legal staff uh, up here in Office of General Counsel as well as in the districts, uh, as well as contacts um, specifically for this program, the, the lab coordinators um, being a resource in the particular district as well as that environmental management leadership. So how do you get access? How do I request access to SWEPT? Um, and really what it comes down to is the way to think about it is this is a closed system. The system does require a username and a password, um, and it re requires that the local um, district environmental management office leadership identify you um, as an individual that should have access within SWEPT, and they identify what is your role, your level of responsibility that you would have within the system, as well as what's the overall jurisdiction. For instance, a person that is granted um, project entry and data entry roles in District 7, FDOT District 7, those responsibilities only exist in District 7. They don't carry over into District 1 or District 3 or anything else. Um, so a big part of that is um, having some communication with that district environmental management office to identify, okay, who needs to be in there, what do they need to do, and what's their jurisdiction. 
um, if the lap, if it's determined that a lap agency should have some participants there, they would again work through that district environmental leadership um, to gain access. The only access that are granted to individuals that have uh, that are coming in from the lap is what we call project data entry, and I'll go through those various roles just a little bit. That allows you to like set up the project, um, begin to draft the materials, and kind of prepare things as it begins to move through a much larger uh, approval process that occurs um, beyond uh, just your role and responsibility. Um, if you're a consultant, they, same thing, send a, uh, work through your consultant project managers in the district uh, who will work through the leadership and, and uh, gain access as well. When you're looking at the, the SWEP roles, we talked about sort of a little bit on there, which was the difference between, say, a project manager and data entry. And you'll notice on the data entry side, um, basically the way to think about it is the project data entry role is kind of setting things up for the approval. So they're creating the project itself. They're uploading the documentation to support the record. They're drafting some of the materials that are ultimately going to go through the approval process. And the way things work is if you think about it, it's a constant bubble up. Think about individuals um, drafting material, it going through some internal um, QA, QC, it bubbles up to a higher level entity. Um, it could be a FDOT project manager, it could be a consultant project manager, it could be somebody who's taking some ownership over what's being drafted. Um, they then um, have the ability to review the materials and if everything um, looks good, then they bubble it up through their district leadership to have uh, it approved. Um, the district, depending on the nature of the environmental document that's going to be approved, some approvals stay at the district. So for instance, you were creating a type one categorical exclusion. That's a delegated responsibility, always has been a delegated responsibility down to the district environmental management office. Your drafting um, of the type one and supporting material would go to that approval authority in the district for their review and approval. If you happen to be working on something that is a higher level document, think of um, a type two categorical exclusion um, or potentially an EA or, or something higher uh, to an EIS, you have to go through a, another layer uh, beyond the district of approvals as well. That would um, be recommended for approval from the districts and then it would bubble up into the Office of Environmental Management approval process um, and would continue on until ultimately um, you would receive a signature from the director of the Office of Environmental Management. Um, through that NEPA assignment MOU, that's the individual within our agency that has the authority to sign those documents as we stand in and take those, assume those responsibilities from FHWA. If we're coming back and thinking about LAP um, and where they would be assigned, if we had individuals that were um, working on LAP projects that ultimately were going to be signed by the district or by the Director of Office of Environmental Management, um, those individuals um, would, the level of access they would have would be um, project data entry. So I just wanted to highlight that. Again, kind of the difference on the roles. The editor role is you're setting up that initial project file, you're uploading files into the database, you're beginning to draft the initial um, checklists or supporting materials uh, that are uh, uploaded into the system that ultimately someone would review and approve. Um, they funnel up through the, the various district leadership for them to um, either approve or recommend and certify that it's ready to, to move on through approval. Uh, as we go through the, the various process, and that could be, um, it's a two-leveled approval process within the uh, district, so simultaneously you would receive um, approval um, from the district environmental manager as well as the project development manager as well. So all that being said, um, before we go into some more details, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. The focus of this training is going to be, we're going to talk about, okay, if we're a project entry person, um, we're uh, a lab agency participant, we're just getting access to the system, 
We're going to give an overview of sort of the, the navigation of the site, um, and then we're going to come back and talk through um, the environmental process, the approval process, and you can kind of see where your piece of everything kind of fits in the overall scheme of that approval process. So I'm going to give it back to Mike, and then um, he's going to go through the site in a general way, and then he'll give it back to me for some more details. So, Mike. All right. Thank you, Pete. Um, today we're going to be demonstrating from our testing and training server. So um, just to let you know, while you may see some real project information and, and names, it's all test data. Um, I'm going to be logging in as a project data entry role. And what you'll see when you log into SWEPT is uh, a layout that looks like this. Um, there is a, a breadcrumb trail on the very top left. So as you navigate through the site, that will update um, depending on where you visit in the menu. Um, beneath that, uh, you've got this uh, menu icon that allows you to collapse the navigation menu. So I'm opening and closing that. The site's designed to be responsive, so it works on um, various screen sizes and with uh, all the major modern browsers. Um, and so you'll, you'll be able to use it on a tablet, on a phone, uh, or on your desktop uh, or laptop computer. Um, the OEM and SWEP logos are a link that take you back to this landing page that we're looking at now. And then beneath that are, um, is the navigation menu. Um, there's a link to view alerts uh, when you're prompted for various actions. Those will appear there. Um, there's a project input setup menu. That's where you'll find all the uh, forms that you can fill out in SWEPT, uh, like the type one, the type two, the reevaluation. Um, project documents uh, is where you'll find the environmental documents submittal form, which is a form for routing environmental documents for approval. Um, then we have a projects needing approval menu. Um, this is really for the, the approvers, but any, anywhere from the district leadership on up to the OEM project delivery coordinators, environmental process administrators, uh, OGC if they're involved, uh, and the director, um, they have their list of projects awaiting their approval. And there's an overall OEM uh, status report where you can see who is the last signature on a document, who's the next signature, and when were those actions taken. Um, project dashboards are um, for the schedule data for projects. So we've got various um, instances of the dashboards. There's the federal. That includes the Type 2s, the EAs, the EISs, um, the state. SWAT dashboard includes the uh, SEERS, and then some projects have been flagged for higher level um, scrutiny will appear on the executive dashboards, and they have the same kind of organization, federal and state. Uh, and um, we also have some performance reporting. Um, under the reports menu, you can find listings, searchable listings of the approved type 1 and type 2 CADEX. Um, projects, as well as a project approvals report that will let you search uh, both the type 1s, type 2s, and, and the higher level documents. And then there's a help menu um, that has a, an overview um, of what help is available um, and kind of describes the stuff I'll be going over right now. Um, we have quick guides. Uh, that go in a little bit deeper um, into how to complete certain processes, but they're meant to be um, uh, printable and uh, a high-level overview of, of those processes. Um, we have training videos where we actually demonstrate uh, some of the features of SWEPT, and, and those recordings are available for you to, to review and, and get refreshed. Um, and then we have our SWEPT contact list, which is um, both for central office and then for all the districts, who are the um, contacts for SWEP? So uh, environmental review analysis, engineering, uh, administrative support for each district, OGC, and then the district uh, environmental leadership. 
Um, moving up to the upper right of the site, there's another alert icon. This one um, will go to the same My Alerts page that's in the in the left menu, um, but it will also show a red uh, circle with a number in it, um, and those alerts are refreshed every so often. So as things pop up, uh, you'll see a number uh, potentially show up there, and you can click to see uh, what actions you may have. Um, there's also a profile, user profile icon. Uh, this is where you can find the change password function. You can update your contact information and then also log out from the site. Um, beneath that, there's a search function. So you can search by FM number, project name, um, any or all of a part of a document name. So for example, I'll type uh, State Road 20 and you, you can see the results listing. I've got various projects that match that name, documents, and um, and then you can also search for people's names, um, and then you can uh, use the options to determine which which results you're more interested in. Uh, going back to the home page, um, we have. Uh, Uh, we also have here module menus, so these correspond to the um, menu items on the left, and they'll take you to landing pages for those various modules. Beneath that, uh, we've got uh, a quick view of your alerts. Um, here it's telling me there's been some changes. Usually that means something's changed in work program, like the project's name or FAP number. Uh, those things are pulled in from work program nightly and updated on our site. Um, You've got a listing of my projects. These are projects where you've been assigned uh, some role, say as an editor on the project. Uh, and then you've got my region. These would be all projects in the district for a district user. Those lists are filterable. You can use the uh, menus that appear above the columns to filter. Some of them you can even um, type in the name and they'll, they'll filter down as you type. Um, the links, uh, the FM numbers are links that take you to the project page. And I'll open one of those now. And if you, you can either click the link to go directly to the page. Sometimes I like to control click. That opens the link in a new tab so you can uh, have both uh, views open. Um, and here we're looking at a, a project page. Um, and it starts out with the project name coming from work program. FM numbers, here we just see the, um, the primary FM number for this project, but the editors are able to add other FM numbers using these edit buttons. Each FM number has a link to the item segment overview and project suite um, enterprise edition for that FM. Uh, FAP numbers, if they're available, are pulled in from work program along with the group identifiers, the district, the county, um, the project description is something you can enter as an editor. Work mix, uh, activity type comes from work program. Class of action will be something you enter when you're setting up the project. ETDM numbers you can add here um, through a dialog. And also the local agency program information can be edited here. We'll come back to that later. Uh, you've got on the Middle column, the district project team, these are all the editors and project manager if assigned. The OEM reviewers, and in this case, again, we're on, on our staging server, so there's more um, leads and, and backups than there would normally be on, on a um, uh, project, and also um, some new roles for some additional functionality that is coming soon uh, where districts will be able to assign the reviewer role to folks to be able to come in and review documents, not necessarily edit them. Uh, OGC reviewers, if any, can be found uh, below that. And then there's a detailed project contact listing with contact information, more contact information, including mailing address. Uh, we also have a listing of all the notifications that have gone out for the project. So as the project moves through different approval processes, notifications are sent via email. Those will be listed here on the project notifications link. And then you can see there's a small project map that highlights uh, the project segment. 
moving down the page, um, you've got the project schedule data. This is coming from the PSM database, and it's imported um, nightly. So it says here uh, it's from an export file dated from early this morning, not a live connection to the database. So as those schedule dates are updated in, P in PSM, they're pulled in nightly and will appear here. Green uh, means the date occurred on time or early, yellow behind by less than two weeks, red more than two weeks behind schedule, and the A means the date has been actualized. And then beneath that, we've got the project documents listing. This is where you'll both upload files to um, to SWEPT, as well as create um, some of those forms within SWEPT. So, for example, uh, editors can create a scope of services. They can create a type 2 checklist. Um, you can see we, we have some new versions of that we're working on. Uh, the environmental document submittal form, status of environmental certification for federal project, as well as state, if it was a state project. Uh, and then some, here we have a couple of files that have already been uploaded uh, for this particular project. Those can be sent over to EDMS uh, for the, where they'll appear the next day. Um, I'm going to move down the listing um, and show you beneath that, any files that have been tagged as correspondence will be relisted below. And then if you are one of the editors on the project, you have access to the confidential attorney work products, if any, have been uploaded to the file. And let me just show you what um, the file upload looks like. So if you are um, maintaining the project file and uploading files to SWEPT, you, you would use the upload button that appears uh, in the category that corresponds to the file that you are uploading. So let's say I'm uploading it archaeological and historical file, and maybe it's a crass addendum, I would choose, you know, what type of file that is, and then I would navigate to the file. Uh, I can uh, put in a, a, a name for the file. It'll pick up that name from the, you know, the actual file name on your computer, but you can rename it. And uh, we have a file naming convention that gets applied consistently to all our files. So it starts out with FM number, um, class of action, the district. Then the middle portion is the, uh, the, the file name that you're giving it here in this box. And then the date. The date's coming from the publication date. Um, so let's say this file was from uh, April 1. You can see that date is applied to the file naming convention. In addition to the file name, you also have a description for the document. So um, let's say it's a grass addendum. You can give further details about what that uh, document is. And then we ask a short series of questions with some defaults that uh, um, apply to most files. So is this an attorney work product? Most cases, that would be no. Um, is it part of the administrative record? Most cases, that would be yes. Is it exempt from public record? Uh, typically, no. Does the file contain, but maybe for historic and archaeological, it would be yes. Does this file contain information that supports other topics? This allows you to tag the file as belonging to other areas, and the same link to the file can appear under multiple of these folders, depending on what the file is. So if you say yes here, you get the folder structure listed again and you can check which other areas that file may apply to, and then that link will appear in all those areas. One thing I wanted to add uh, into that, and actually this is a great screen to be able to show it, is that so behind the scenes in the database, um, especially, and you've heard Mike probably say it a couple times, he talks about the EDMS, which is the um, electronic document management system and is um, a system that we use at Florida DOT to serve as the official record in the department. It manages our archives. It um, is our disaster and recovery storage of the files. And the way things are organized in that electronic database is it's tied to this concept of groups and types. Um, so a group might be NEPA, and a type might be um, cultural 
as a, as a type. And then these types of files may exist underneath there. The reason why this is important is because at the file level, you may have different retention requirements and storage requirements for those files. Um, by just using this interface and just navigating to the, to the appropriate um, folder location and selecting the right product is what we call it. Um, behind the scenes, it's passing all of the information to EDMS to tell it where to physically store it and for how long to store it. Um, so that's just an important point that when we rolled out SWEP, that was an important point to be able to handle that integration into that um, archival system because the system is kind of clunky, requires a lot of work and a lot of attributes. But the reality is by interacting with this application, we already know who you are, we know which project you're working on, we know what the date is and what file you're working on. And then once you tell us where it needs to go, we can populate it with all of the, the right attributes and make sure that we're actively managing these files. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. So you can save the file. It'll give you a message that it's being uploaded. And then the file appears um, along with its publication date and file size. You can use the modify button to reopen that dialog or the delete button to actually remove the file. Sometimes you'll see the modify and delete buttons are grayed out. Typically that means that that file is attached to a form in SWEP. So rather than delete it from here, you would have to go to the form that it's attached to, and here it's attached to a draft type 2. You would actually have to go in and edit the type 2 form to, um, to remove that file. Um, and that is um, just to show you the edit and create buttons. That is how you create forms uh, within SWEPT that SWEPT provides. So an example is the type 2 form. Another example is the type 1 form, also the reevaluation form. Um, when you are in one of those forms, you'll see the buttons above um, the form. Some of them become enabled. So that's typically what these buttons are for. The PDF button will create a PDF of the form. The zip icon will create a zip file of the form along with its supporting documentation. Some of our reports, like the uh, approvals report, have an Excel export. And then uh, we also have the scope of services has a Word export. So these will allow you to export those uh, documents to the various formats. And then we also have this filing cabinet icon. This is how you can get from a form back to the project page, uh, which is the home of all the project files. So that's the overview. Sure, if you want to hand it back to me, we'll just go through a little bit more and then we'll walk through kind of filling out one of those forms and how it all works. Great. Make sure everybody can see, fantastic. So let's talk about where folks sort of fit in. Now, what I'm showing on the screen is a lot of information. Um, it's really the review process and at a very high level, I just wanted the folks that were um, attending this training to be aware. So in this first section, one and two, the documents are drafted. Um, they're internally reviewed to a point where you're doing all of the, at the, the very low district level, QA, QC, it's all internal amongst yourselves, amongst the agencies kind of, um, staff working with the district to um, make sure that the, the document um, is written correctly, has all the appropriate attachments, um, you know, all of those various things. Um, and if it makes it through that process, then it would go through the district certification and then depending on what the nature of the, the document is, it could stop right at an approval. Um, for higher level documents, which folks on this training may or may not be a part of, things like a Type 2, an EA, an EIS, or a reevaluation of one of those, there's a, a, a longer process that once it leaves the district, then it also goes through an external review process that involves staff from the Office of Environmental Management, where they have an opportunity to um, 
review the materials and submit comments back to the district. The district prepares responses. Um, OEM, the staff up here, has an opportunity to review those responses. And then if everything's good to go, then it begins the approval process. Um, the, the local district project manager is, is told, yes, go ahead and approve it. It moves up to their leadership. That leadership makes a recommendation to approve that document, whether it's a type two, an EA, EIS, or one of those reevaluations. They send it up to the Office of Environmental Management um, who verifies it. Um, hopefully, if not, they can send it back for some more work. And then it goes into the overall Office of Environmental Management approval process that involves a two-tiered review from staff level up to the uh, program administrators and Office of General Counsel if needed, and they provide a recommendation uh, to the Office of Environmental Management Office uh, Director. This last part taking about 30 days. The reason I bring all that up is because in this training, I wanted folks to understand where, where you all fit. Um, if you're an entity that um, working through the district are um, granted access to uh, the SWEPT application and you're developing the initial um, project setup and some of the materials and you're creating the project record, you're uploading items and you're drafting checklists and stuff. Um, I just wanted to show you in the overall structure sort of where, where your box is. So everything we go over, everything that this role would do all fits in that, that first box. Um, but there's many more things that happen after that. You just wouldn't necessarily be a part of it. Something you would potentially be a part of is think about how comments can come back to you. So you may get to a point if you were granted access to draft these materials and people review those materials. There may be a need um, to go back and um, uh, look at those materials and edit them based on the comments. Uh, and so there are functions in place. They're really designed for much higher level documents that are already being handled between the district environmental staff and the Office of Environmental Management. But I just wanted you to be aware that there is sort of this process in place that allows us to either return things back um, to the start of the uh, things that needed to be fixed are gonna take a long time or uh, they need to be rethought. Um, and there's also this minor edit process, which is uh, the edits are considered to be editorial, minor corrections, they can be uh, updated very quickly, um, and it allows you to stay within the existing approval timeline uh, and get those edits quickly corrected uh, and then approved. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of those, those two processes. Um, but with that being said, we're going to jump back to being a project editor, and I'm going to hand it back to Mike. And what he's going to go through is how to um, do like a type one and how you would actually interact with the system and how you would upload documents and things like that. So with that, let's hand it back to Mike and let him finish going through the demo, and then we'll follow up to see if there's any, any questions. So we're going to start with a type one form and again you would find that under the project input setup menu and the type one categorical exclusion checklist item and the first thing you'll see is a prompt for the fm number so you will enter the fm number and i've just picked one uh, at random and and while mike is entering that fm number i wanted to hit a key point that folks maybe don't understand Mike did gloss over the fact that every night we get a data dump of our work program database. The work program database is what we consider to be our financial management numbers, those FM numbers, and those equate to what we consider to be, FM is like our bank account, like if you're a bank. Um, the project needs to exist with that FM number in that bank account that shows that um, we're thinking about it, we're spending money on it, um, it's been programmed, um, so what you do initially is when someone is setting up one of these projects is, is they're, they're verifying that the FM that they've been given that says this work is going to be performed actually exists in that database. So Mike's 
doing a demonstration, and the first thing they're doing is looking against the, the, the bank database to make sure that number exists. Thank you. And uh, you can enter all 11 digits of the FM number and load it. Um, I'm going to show you where it, uh, you have to enter at least the item number and the segment, and then you can hit the load button, and it'll show you all FMs that match uh, that item and segment. So here we have um, a couple of FMs with uh, different um, uh, phase group and type uh, for this item segment, and we'll pick one. Okay, and you can see it loads uh, the type one form, and I'm going to collapse the left menu, and then I'm just going to kind of zoom in a little bit um, so you can see the form better. Um, and starts out with the FM number. You can put in related FM numbers, um, and this will, is an auto completer. So as soon as you enter at least six digits, it'll show you. Um, a listing of matching FMs, and so you just pick one and it'll add it to the list, and you can add as many of those as needed, um, and that's helpful if, if you have um, projects that are related to each other. Um, it pulls in the federal aid number for the primary FM number from the work program, as well as the name, the work mix, and the county. And then what's new um, is we have a local agency program um, Options. So, to be considered lab projects, federal dollars must be programmed in the adopted work program is the note, and then you'll uh, click on the lab option. It's either yes or no. Um, if you say yes, there's a follow-up question asking for the lab agency name. Um, this is also an auto-completer, so um, if you don't know, you can just hit spacebar and it'll show you every uh, lab agency. We're on the stage database. There's a lot of test ones in there, so I'm just going to start typing, um, and I'm start, starting to type the county name, and just for the purpose of demonstration, assume that Escambia County is a LAP agency, and you would select that. Beneath that LAP agency name, you'll see the selection for whether the agency is already pd and &E LAP certified or will need to be pd and &E LAP certified via the LAP coordinator, so you'll make the appropriate um, selection. And then the rest of the form is the same as the type one form uh, that you're used to. You select uh, the appropriate CE type, either C list or D list, and then um, the appropriate item from the list. I'm, I'm going to choose one at random, so it's, it's not what this project is actually about. Um, you put in the project description. Here you can um, either cut and paste from Word or type in a project description. And for those of you who may not have seen it, we also have the ability now to insert um, images into the project description. So you can either upload one or you may have some uh, recently uploaded images that you can pick from. So here, here's an image uh, in the project description. You can right click that will allow you to um, resize the image using your unit of choice. Um, it shows you the original size. You can give the image a label. You can choose the image alignment, left, middle, or right, and then whether you want to preserve aspect ratio, meaning um, should the image maintain its width to height ratio as you resize it. One thing on this note that I want folks to, to think about is Mike is demonstrating the functionality of the features in the text editor. You wouldn't be putting a picture inside your project description. But the text editor itself, which is how you would enter information throughout the use of the form, has these advanced functions that allow you to bold things, italicize things, put in bullets, lists. Um, you can put in images. He's showing a really pretty one right now, but maybe it was a table out of a report that you want to use to um, demonstrate you know, how, how things relate across various alternatives because you're answering a different question. But overall, um, 
every one of these text editors have these functionalities, so what he's showing is just that ability within the text editor. Obviously, if you're filling out the form, you know, the, the information that belongs in the text editor, um, answering that question should be very relevant to whatever it is you're, you're answering. So, uh, project description, you would expect to see a, a few lines of text, right, describing exactly what the project is. But later on, you may have something that says, how do you know uh, you don't have uh, any uh, threatened or endangered species locations? You may have a, a table or a chart that you wanted to embed that quickly shows how you did your analysis and what the results were. So this is just an example. Um, and it's a great example, and I'm glad that it's being shown. I just wanted to, to highlight that. Just because you can do it in a text box doesn't mean that that's an appropriate spot to do it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the clarification, Pete. And I, I am going to show um, uh, copying a table from Word. So here I just have a sample table. And I'm going to uh, select the table and copy it. Um, and I'm going to paste it into the description. So um, you do have that ability. Uh, and once the table's in there, you can also um, edit it within the application. Um, and then moving on in the form, um, you're asked uh, to read the note and the directions about um, uh, if, if the project has any significant impact, stop, this form does not apply, check verified, so you can proceed through the rest of the form. So this action will not induce significant impacts, et cetera. You would verify that statement, and then the rest of the form appears. Um, and the form is a series of questions about uh, various uh, issues and resources, starting with right away, going into wetlands, bridge, permits, floodplains, um, wild and scenic rivers, endangered species. Um, the form is interactive, so as you answer questions one way or the other, follow-up questions may appear. So for example, ESA listed species present, um, used key, no consultation required, you would have to enter the name of the species um, for that. While Mike's uh, doing that, a couple other things. This is just an overview training. Um, we do have some more detailed training on actually filling out a type one and what the appropriate choices would be. That's available on our website, which we can show you at the end. Um, the other things are, this is mechanically like how the tool works. If you have questions on how to interpret a question, how should I answer it, what's the appropriate documentation that needs to be in there, you really work through your district environmental management office um, for guidance. If they need to, they can, they're more than welcome to pull in um, their office of environmental management project delivery coordinator up here. Um, we have uh, individuals assigned to each geographic FDOT district that are always available to help provide guidance and answer questions. Um, but your first stop, if you're trying to draft these things and you've got some questions, um, should really be with your district environmental management office folks. They've been doing this stuff for a long time and they should be able to help. As you fill out the questions, um, if you've provided the information that's expected and filled out the boxes that are expected, you'll see this has required documentation um, indicator change from a red exclamation point to a green check mark. And so you can see some of these questions I haven't answered yet, they, they still need information. Um, I'm going to scroll through the rest of the form and just show you um, some of these items do have um, documentation upload buttons, those functions similar to what you saw on the project page. The difference is here we know, for example, this is a noise uh, related file. So when you go to upload it, um, it's going to zero in on that. You can also, in addition to noise, if it was related to other areas, you could select that, but it's going to default to that noise area. Uh, and then scrolling through. Um, some of the comment boxes are required. Those will be indicated with the red required text. Some of them are optional. Those are marked with the optional green um, text there. So you'll fill out the form. Um, as you upload documents, they'll be listed all together in this document section. 
you'll be able to choose between um, having them automatically be sorted, which means they're sorted in the order they appear in the document, or custom sorted where you can kind of rearrange um, uh, and change which is attachment three versus attachment four, for example. Um, and then um, you get to the bottom of the form. Um, it gives you some important information as well as a statement about um, the memorandum of understanding with FHWA. And as you're working, you can hit the save draft button to, to save the current state of the form. And so um, I've, I've now saved it. Um, and you get a, a confirmation message that it's saved. Um, and then uh, you can continue and pick up the form and finish later. When you're ready to send it to your project manager um, or district environmental manager for approval, there's a send for approval button that will allow you to do that. And uh, an email will be generated and sent to that individual. They'll be able to review the information, update anything that needs to be updated. They'll be able to send it back to you for more information if needed, or they can actually approve it. And, and I think that that's uh, a key point that maybe folks that aren't necessarily familiar with this application that um, is something else that we probably should highlight is that um, every step throughout the process, um, there are notifications to those that either are the next in line to perform an action or those that have been part of previous actions. The idea is to be transparent with everybody and kind of prompt whatever the next thing uh, that needs to come, like whether it needs to be approved or whether it needs to be a root, uh, uh, reviewed. Whatever the case may be, it's to kind of prompt the next people. So usually the people who have an action are in the two, and then folks that have been part of the process are in the CC. And when you look at the um, email itself, it should provide some pretty concise direction on what's next. Uh, the way the type ones are organized, um, we have this concept of editors. So um, if you are the individual who created the type one, you're automatically an editor. If you have uh, other colleagues that need to work on it with you, let's say they're working on a specific resource area, you would use the add editor button to, um, to add those team members to the project. They will then get an email that says they've been added to the project and, um, and can now uh, edit the type one. So you can, you can edit it um, together and then when the entire document is ready, send for approval. Uh, after you add an editor, it is important to remember you do need to save, uh, always save after you've added an editor. Also, after you've uploaded a document, you do need to actually go to the bottom of the form and hit save for that document to be saved and associated with the type one. Um, once it's saved, you can create a PDF using the PDF button. You can also uh, create a zip file that includes a PDF of the document as well as all of the attachments uh, or supporting documents um, that you can then uh, download and, and have uh, to distribute or, or um, have a copy of. So just to kind of add onto this, so what was demoed today was the type one. We think that's the most common instance that if someone um, outside the department and part of the local agency program um, is granted access to um, draft documents and create projects within SWEP, that seems to be the most common use case um, where they would go find a project, they would start it and create it, and they would begin to go in and draft the responses. Ultimately, after that's completed, um, and as Mike demonstrated and is up on the screen right now, once it's drafted to a point where um, it's ready to begin um, the approval process, that approval process stays within the district, uh, and notifications are sent. The district can then approve the type one that was drafted or they could have some questions and either return it back to you or make uh, some edits to it to ensure that we have, you know, dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's um, as we're developing this documentation. Should we need to go, uh, should the folks that are being provided access need uh, to work on a type two or have Essentially, a reevaluation of a type two or something even higher. Um, 
the tools work exactly the same. Um, you know, when you set up a project, you interact with the interactive form, you upload documentation that substantiate a choice, or you fill in information in a text box that provides some context to a particular uh, selection. From there, the process is the same. Once everything's drafted, it gets reviewed internally to a point where it's ready to be um, uh, it's ready to be approved, and then it moves on through the approval process. Um, each time it moves through the approval process, there are opportunities and feedback loops in place where it could be returned for minor edits or returned all the way um, for uh, some additional revisions. But all in all, the process is really just the same. So maybe you can give it right back to me, Dean, and I think we're about to finish up. Uh, if you could maybe take a look and let me know if there's any questions out there. No, um, Nicole did provide those people that are in her room, so others may want to do that as well. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. The one other thing I wanted to, to kind of finish off with is that, again, this was a recorded session. Um, we put all of the recorded sessions up at this location under SWEAT videos. There's the direct link at the bottom, um, but it's on our regular DOT homepage. We go to the Office of Environmental Management, the OEM training program. Within there, there are several tracks. Um, SWEAT is track number two, and under there, we populate with any of the trainings or recordings that we provided. Um, this was an overview, but there's more detailed training if you want to see how specific forms or processes functioning on there as well. So not hearing any more questions, I just wanted to thank everybody for attending today, and we hope you have uh, a great day and enjoy the rest of your week. Take care. Bye.